Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast, where we talk with veterans, community leaders, and Christians and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to have Abby Kleckner, who is a contributor for the Bad Roman Project. She wrote an article for our blog called Austrian Economics and the Kingdom of Heaven. I will say that I'm not very schooled on Austrian economics, but after reading this article, I realized that I'm a huge fan of it. I, I don't know much about it, and hopefully Abby can steer us in that direction. You know, For those that are unfamiliar with it, when I asked Abby to come on and and help us. She was very hesitant. She didn't have any writing experience, but it turned out she's got a real knack for it. But uh, would you like to give us a summary of uh, Austrian economics before we get into your article? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm definitely an amateur economist. I'm not <laughs> professional by any means, and really, it's it's pretty difficult to get um, an education in Austrian economics because it's not like the, I would say, prevalent school of economics in the U.S. It's basically just free market economics, if you want another synonym for it. But it's more the study of individual human action, how individuals kind of make their choices and how that influences the economy versus like the Keynesian school, uh, is a lot more like math based and graphs and stuff like that for kind of it it has to do a lot more with government intervention so i guess like figuring out at what points the fed should increase the money supply or things like that where austrian economics believes that uh the fed causes the boom bust cycle and that it shouldn't exist and basically proves that any intervention into the economy is harmful rather than helpful. Right. I think uh, individualism to me is, is I think, what turned me on to anarchism in itself. You know, we're, we're, we're so focused on tribalism these days in America. And it's, it's really, it's, it's hard for me to watch, especially uh, with professing Christians to, to watch them get involved with all this. You know, I like the, I like my personal relationship with Jesus, you know, the, the, the one-on-one, I think. And when you, you talked about that in the article, explaining Austrian economics, and I love how you tied it into the relationship between the father of Christ and God. Yeah, definitely. Because I think a lot of times, especially in politics, um, you kind of think like, well, the rights of the individual have to be sacrificed for the greater good. But really, respecting the individual and protecting um, property rights and and individual freedoms is always what's best for the greater good. Um, Sacrificing that will always be detrimental to society. For sure. And you also, there's, when you said uh, you can't blindly rely on a church or other organizations to allocate the resources of your service. Yeah. And I think that's very important, especially when you look at the involvement or the entanglement with Christians and the state, because there's these people are flawed. I mean, they're 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 rushing to put these people in office because but they don't realize that they're that not everybody agrees with them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you've got. The right, and when I say the right, I use air quotes, and when I say the left, I use air quotes because to me they're all the same. I, I see really no difference between them. <laughs> and but they are they rushing to put their guy or their their or their lady in an office because they agree with them. But what about the other person? What if they don't agree with what that person's saying? Right, exactly. It doesn't matter as long as their team's winning. You always end up oppressing the minority in majority rule. And they don't look at it that way. Yeah. I I meant to ask you this earlier. At what point did you realize that that you were an anarchist? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's tough to pinpoint in an exact time. I remember 
There's like moments where I can clearly remember my mind was changed on certain issues. Um, like going to college, I, I got a, a business degree in accounting. Um, so I, was, I didn't get a degree in economics, but they make you take a bunch of economics classes. And I've heard horror stories from other people that they get kind of a Keynesian education, but that was not my experience. And I remember learning a lot of things that really just blew my mind. Like even just like uh, one of the professors just putting up the supply and demand graph and explaining what was damaging about the minimum wage. And of course, your whole life, you hear, especially, you know, being like a teenager finding a job, that how important the minimum wage is. And like, thank God for the minimum wage, or, you know, you would be getting paid nothing. Or, <laughs> you know, you kind of just grow up with that idea. And so hearing, like, oh, minimum wage is not a good thing, but actually prices people out of the market. I remember that really blowing my mind. And also in another economics class, hearing that immigration laws and and barring people from having uh, freedom of movement, that how damaging that is to the economy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like it made so much sense. But you always hear like, well, we have to have immigration laws, how important that is. So, yeah, lear learning about economics, definitely. And then just even after college, it was still my hobby to kind of keep learning stuff because there's so much, I don't know, you grow up hearing the opposite of what is reality. And then you kind of figure out how things work. And you're like, oh, my gosh, that makes so much sense. Um, and then I had the ex same the same experience alongside with like my faith journey of like just learning how freedom in both those aspects kind of works. And <laughs> so they both kind of brought me along at the same time. And then um, let me see. I think, yeah. Oh, when Obama was elected the second time, I think that's when I was kind of done with democracy <laughs> because I was like, okay, you know, he he does all these things that I don't agree with. But then on the other side, all the things he promised to do about like ending the wars and all that kind of stuff, closing Guantanamo. Which was total garbage too. Yeah. And, and he, and he didn't do any of that either. So I'm like, so he's not, you know, making Republicans happy. He's not making Democrats happy. How is this guy getting reelected? And how is it that if people vote for something that's going to make me poorer, that I just have to go along with it? Like, democracy is bull you know <laughs> and uh that's when I kind of started getting disillusioned with the whole system and I, I had already been like come on Republicans you're supposed to be free market let's do this and I was getting frustrated on that end and then frustrated and the whole system of voting and how that didn't make any sense to me and um but yeah I, I definitely remember that being a huge moment of frustration and then I got more into, I think, the 2012 election. I just voted libertarian, like, straight down the line. I was like, if we can just put an end to the two-party system and shake things up a little bit, then maybe we have more of a chance. And then, yeah, that's when I started reading a lot more articles and listening to podcasts. And, um, oh, becoming a pacifist was a big thing, too, because... Oh, I love that. Because... <laughs> No, well, because, all right, so I, I own a weapon myself. Yeah. But I don't, and I like to shoot guns, but I don't, the more I look at it as far as pass, pacifism, I'm starting, I don't, I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing. I'm, you know, I'm saying we're not supposed to be. Pacifism to me, I'm on board, but I'm kind of like, you know, I, I understand the argument. So somebody, somebody breaks into your home, you know, and if somebody comes in and tried to harm one of my cats, I would probably shoot them. Mm -hmm. But we're not supposed to, right? Right. Yeah. And I would say that's been a slow process for me, too. Like, even just becoming anti-war was a big deal because, um, you know, I, I didn't really consider myself a Republican, but I... When 9-11 happened, I was like, yeah, go get the terrorists. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, and I turned into a full-blown neocon that day. I sleep with my TV on. I don't know if it's because I like the noise, but I used to watch Fox News religiously. 
I'd go to sleep watching Fox News. Oh, God. And I remember waking up on 9-11 and hearing them talk about it and then going to work that night. And I was crying listening to some of the, you know, some of the stories and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, we have to go get them back. Yeah. You know, uh, when George Bush was in New York and they were like, go get them, George, you know, and he was, I mean, the war drums were beating mm-hmm. and I was all on board. I was like, we have to go get them back. Yeah. And, and it seemed like we were so like united as a country and, uh, over like the tragedy and everything about it. Yeah. I think a lot of people got swept up in that. You know, almost 20 years later, what's, what, what has changed? Exactly. We've had two decades of war and now trillions, trillions of dollars spent on it is killing people that we'll never meet. Exactly. Like my kid's entire lifetime. Our country has been at war. Exactly. And now my oldest is in high school and they, you know, the recruiters come after the high school kid. Oh, yeah. And he's already had recruiters try to get his information. And it's just like horrifying to me that the, this happened. Gosh, I was 19 at the time. And now he's 16. And it's like now they're trying to rec- recruit him for that war that started when I was almost his age, it's crazy. You know, the kids were born that day and now they're old enough to go into service and it's all, yeah. and it's, it's for nothing, man. I mean, I, I, it drives me crazy. You know, our freedoms not rest in Syria or Yemen. Why in the world are we in Yemen? Absolutely. And that's the thing, too, especially with the people who are still like, you know, the support of our troops people. It's like they can't even tell you the history of why we're in which country, why it increases how many countries we're in all the time. Uh, the difference between Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Like, <laughs> I remember when that was pointed out to me and I realized like, Oh, yeah, I didn't even notice when they switched who our enemy was. And it's just like when right. you read 1984 and it's like, oh, no, we're in we're at war with Eurasia. We've always been at war with Eurasia. Like they have successfully done that to us. I remember, yeah, realizing that was a big deal. Like, oh, my gosh, they how do they do that? It's like we're all under mind control. Have you ever seen the movie uh, The Others with Nicole Kidman? Where they're like ghosts, but don't realize they're ghosts. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did see that a long time ago. Yeah, well, it was on HBO or something the other day. And, and it was it got me thinking because one of her kids, you know, her husband was off on, in war. And one of her kids, I can't remember exactly what he said, but because she goes, he's doing the right thing because he's going to fight the baddies. And he goes, well, how do you know who the goodies and the baddies are? And so in Syria, when uh, ISIS was like, I don't know, they were trying to take over Syria or whatever. Our government, who's supposed to be fighting these guys, was actually supporting ISIS right? in, the, in their efforts. And when you point that out to people, they, they, the, the blank stare that I get from people when you point some of this stuff out is starting to get a little creepy. I'm not going to lie. Like you look, <laughs> you look, they, like their their eyes glaze over. It's like they're programmed. We were all programmed. But you got to you gotta break yeah. out of that. Yeah, and they're like searching their programming to see where that fits in and how they can uh, give you a rebuttal. You know, the support the troops things drives me crazy too because, and I tell people, I said, I support them so much that I'm tired of our government sending them and getting them killed in countries that we have no business being in. Absolutely. I want them all home. I want them home with their families. Absolutely. Like, even if they're not injured, the amount of PTSD the amount of soldiers who commit suicide and just the damage that it does to their families, um, the like higher rates of divorce and domestic violence. Like it's, it's a horrible, horrible institution. Even, even if you come back alive, even if you come back uninjured, like there, there's no way to get out of it without suffering some kind of damage. Well, it's not natural. Absolutely. I mean, I don't, you know, God creates everybody in his own image. And, and if God is love, right? Yes. It's not natural to, to act the way we do. Right. And I can see, you know, you, I have friends that have been, that have served. 
I have family that have served and the stories that they tell me that I've heard them talk about, and they don't talk about it a lot, but you know, when they do kind of open up about what they saw, you know, over there, it's heartbreaking, but there, you know, a lot of them are still entangled in all that too, mm-hmm. which is, it is what it is. I mean, I think, uh, if we can just maybe one person at a time kind of deal. Yeah. And stop, stop the young kids from joining too. Like if they can have their eyes open to the reality before the recruiters tell them all the stuff they tell them, you know, like free college and health insurance and all that kind of stuff. Oh, (laughs) it's not free by the way. Right. Right. You know, you live in Colorado, you know, I've been from the South. I live in Tennessee now. And the, uh, this guy I work with is big into the civil war and he's always, he's just, he, he loves reading about it and talking about it. And I'm like, you know, they were killing each other. Right. They were killing each other. If people would let that sink in for a minute and think about what's happening. I mean, we are advocating for killing and I want, and I'm talking about just Christians now. Mm-hmm. People that are, you know, non-Christian are going to do whatever they're going to do. But my, my, my focus or my goal with this project is to get Christians to pay attention to what Jesus taught. The Sermon on the Mount is beautiful. Yes. I love reading that. I, I try to read it, you know, at least once a week because it helps keep me focused, you know, because I could, I could go out, walk out the door and just be as hateful as the next guy. Right. But if I try to keep that focus... It helps. I think if we show the love of Christ, that will change people's minds. Yeah. And I think that that was the thing. Um, like, you know, growing up, being a Christian, you hear all the time that you're supposed to love your enemies. Like, you know that. Um, but I don't know. I guess in youth group and stuff, you think of enemies as being like, oh, the the girl who's mean to me in my math class or whatever. But then becoming an adult and being like, I don't know, you you separate out like, well, like war is different and like self-defense is different. But then it's kind of like, well, I don't know if if the person trying to rob my house or not... I I hesitate to call like the people we're fighting in the Middle East our enemies because most of them are just regular people that we don't even know. But even like active terrorists, it's like, well, are those not our enemies that we're called to love? Like one day that clicked in my brain and I was like, oh, my gosh, like it never even put it in that category, which is crazy because you think of the the time Jesus was living in and the apostles actively loving their enemies when they were being put in jail and they were being put to death. Like those were the people that they were called to love and not fight back against, you know? And it's, it's just like, we're so sheltered in our country that we think of people we disagree with as our enemies rather than people that were like, our government is actively killing, which it's just crazy. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know. Like Facebook memories drive me crazy because a lot of my old Neocon posts show up and <laughs> I don't even know that guy anymore. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's embarrassing to me. I like to share them in the anarcho Christian group just because <laughs> it gets a laugh, you know? Right. Well, and we've all been there, you know, like, gosh, I can clearly remember because my dad is a Democrat. And I remember when uh, George Bush started the war after 9-11, my dad was so upset about it and so against it. And I remember going to visit and saying to him, like, well, what? So you think Saddam Hussein should just get to be in power and it's not a good thing that we're getting him out of there? Some ridiculous nonsense. and. I think my dad was very patient with me, but (laughs) it's so embarrassing to think back like, oh, my gosh, I defended the war in Iraq and I was totally convinced that there was WMDs. And (laughs) oh, boy, do you uh, remember or have you noticed that 
like when you talk to other anarchists and you talk and you know, they tell you about their story and how they be, they came to anarchism, have you noticed that a lot of our stories are similar? Oh yeah. I was uh, me and Stephen Rose messaged some and I sent him that trailer, you know, to let him listen to and give me some feedback on it. And he goes, "Man, our stories are very similar." Wow. You know, and then you talk to other anarchists, and the the, the stories are is are similar. I don't know if the majority of us come back from conservative backgrounds or not. And again, I use conservatives in, in air quotes because yeah, I was explaining that to my boss the other day. I said they're not they're not conservatives. You know, he said that he used to be conservative. Now he leans more socialist. <laughs> and I was talking about you know, and this is how I broke the news to him that I'm an anarchist. I said you know, but I think we can handle this on our own. We can help people on our own. Yeah, people are naturally giving people. They want to help. Right. But when you got government stealing from you, how, can you imagine how much more charitable we could be if they weren't taxing us? I know if we had double our incomes. I mean, the average person plays, pays half their income in taxes if you combine all the taxes. Right. When he said, he goes, uh, he goes, no, because some people won't give. Yeah. And I said, that's fine. They don't have to. I said, what you're advocating for is force. And the look on his face, like he's like he's. His eyebrows kind of snarled <laughs> up, you know, and he and he said he mumbled force. I said, government is force, man. I said if you're if you're yeah if you're advocating for government to take money from people to give to others, that's force. Yeah. I said, what happens if, if you don't pay your taxes? You go to jail. That's coercion. That's extortion. And it kind of he goes, well, I got to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> the conversation ended pretty quickly after that, oh, but geez. it was, uh, it was fun though. I mean, I like being able to, yeah. to use the term anarchist because I, the, the, the look on people's face when you say, you know, I always get that smirk, Yeah, you know, they kind of laugh at you. One guy's like, so you're just going to go fight the government? I was like, no, I don't want anything to do with them. My goal is, is the, the individual. Right. Exactly. And I think that that's where it has to be. And, um, yeah, I could because I think even when people find anarchy, I think you you kind of have that tendency to want to replace and have some kind of authoritarian structure. A lot of people use the church in that way. Oh, yeah, the church has to be set up this way, and the only person who can talk is the ordained pastor, and it better not be a woman, and the man has to be the head of his household, and you know. But it's like, well, no. That's not the way Jesus did it. We all have to be serving each other and put, trying to put ourselves lower than each other and try to look at the other's needs and fill those and not be trying to control on an individual basis. We just have to daily just give up our control and give up our power all the time. I'm, that's how I think is the only way it's going to happen. But what you were saying reminded me, I was going to say um, people naturally don't want to kill each other and war is unnatural that uh i forget where i read it some kind of study but they they had done a study where uh like in world war one and world war two the amount of soldiers who were like actually taking shots and the amount of sh soldiers who would actually try to aim and hurt somebody <laughs> when they were shooting their guns was really really low and so over time that's been something that the army um, well, the whole military has really focused on is trying to train that out of them so that they both um, dehumanize the enemy and um, just use like muscle memory and don't think about that they're actually killing another human. And so by the time Vietnam happened, they had been really successful in getting people to kind of shoot without thinking and that's when the PTSD really started skyrocketing because then they don't have time to think about it until afterwards and kind of sitting with what you've done is really what's taking a toll on the soldiers. Well, that reminded me, uh, you listened to uh, Free Man Beyond the Wall some, right? Yeah. I, I was listening one day and he had, uh, he had uh -huh. three guys on, they're all uh, vets. And one of them talked about, he said, you don't, he said, as a Christian, he said that those people that were trained to kill, that's God's creation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember that one. And they don't look at it as, 
That's God's creation. God created that person, that person in his own image. In his own image. Yeah, they're beautiful and you're called to love them. Not kill them. It's sad. I think uh, I think though this is how we're going to have to or hope for the change is just to just to love them. You know, you know, they're probably going to hate us, you know. Jesus was hated by a lot of people, still is today, you know, and, but he still loves them, you know, and it is, it, and it, there's no wishy-washiness about it. Yeah. He loves them regardless. It's one of the things that's hard, you know, for us or for me, you know, I guess I should say to understand or comprehend is mm -hmm. the amount of uh, love that he has for us. You mm -hmm. know, I don't think we'll fully understand it until we or standing with him, you know what I mean? Right. And we can read the Bible and talk about, you know, read what he says and, and think about, you know, when he went to the cross for us, but it's hard for me to, to understand that kind of love. I think I would do that for, you know, a family member, but for a total stranger. Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. I would like to think that I would, but it's, it's, uh, it's hard to say. And they don't look at it that way. They think they're going to fix all of this by electing the right guy. It's it's pretty embarrassing to me, actually. Oh, yeah, definitely. That goes to, too, especially for, for Christians, really um, not trusting God or relying on God or using God's plan to restore the earth or bring around good things, but that we have to have this, well, like, God is great, but... I'm going to go with this political candidate because I think he has a little bit more power than God to create the world the way I think it should be kind of attitude, you know? It's embarrassing. Yeah. And I, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if it's because my eyes are wide open now compared to, you know, I mean, I was a neocon. Yeah. And I thought if we went and bombed the crap out of everybody, we're going to fix all this. And you've read, uh, Keith Giles' book, Jesus Untangled. Yeah, I love that book. Phenomenal book. I mean, it, had I read that book 10 years ago, I'd be cussing him out. I'd probably be sending <laughs> him messages. But, you know, reading it now as an anarchist, I was applauding the whole thing. And I don't even know if he claims to be an anarchist, but that book <laughs> sure seems like he is. Yeah. You know, but he well, said, we will never kill our way to peace, nor will we vote our way to paradise. Absolutely. And that stuck with me. I mean, that, I mean that 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 hit me, and, I, and I, I couldn't share it enough on Facebook. I think I've probably pissed enough family members off and friends <laughs> <laughs> with, with this uh, with my comments. You know, quoting that book. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, it really it really opened my eyes. Like I was already considering myself an anarchist before I read that book. Um, like you. So it, yeah, it gives you a different perspective, but I think I was still a little bit, um, I know the, like the last thing to let go of for me was voting and I was, I hadn't voted. That was when it came out like right after Trump was elected. And I was glad to not vote in that presidential <laughs> election at all, but I was still like, well, you know, like, um, what if a bill comes out to raise taxes or what if, you know, the stuff like that, like, should I give up voting altogether? Should I still be involved in the system a little bit? Should I be involved in local politics at least? And then I read that book and it just made me realize like, that's coming from fear. That's because I don't trust God and the Holy Spirit to do work in my community that's going to resolve these things. I'm still out of fear putting my trust in government. And I was like, oh man, I'm totally done with government i'm so excited <laughs> like that's I'm, it i'm grinning, I'm I'm grinning like a possum <laughs> i'm grinning like a possum listen to this because it's it's a good segue into what i was going to talk about oh, next cool. is when you uh let me see when you uh your example of the fda using fear to justify its existence had me applauding yeah. when i was reading this because that's exactly what government is. It's based off of fear. Yeah, exactly. They tell you, well, if we, if we don't, if, you know, I remember, you know, I was a huge George W. Bush fan. And I thought we have to get him reelected. Otherwise, they're going to come attack us again. Yeah. You know, because the Democrats are weak on foreign policy. Turns out the Democrats are just as hateful 
as Republicans right? yeah. with foreign policy. You know, they, they pay lip service to it, but you're, you're absolutely correct. It's all based on fear. I had a friend of mine tell me uh, he, that he vote, he doesn't vote for people, but he votes for issues. And I'm like, well, but you're still begging the government. Yeah. It, it, this is this is my viewpoint. So you're still asking the government permission. No, I don't need I don't need them. Exactly. You know, the, the, the thought of anarchism or a voluntary society scares the crap out it of people. Does. But they don't understand what anarchism is. Mm-hmm. They see like uh, Antifa. That's what they view anarchism as. Right. And that the government projects that. And so that's so they think you have to have government. Otherwise, this will all fall apart. Well, newsflash, it's all falling apart. Right, yeah. Like, people are getting bombed and murdered every single day. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Like, I don't know. It seems like it's going pretty bad. <laughs> like, Yeah, right. I mean, how, how, how in the world is this better with government? Right, exactly. Hey, I got an idea. Let's just give it a shot and see how it works. Yeah, give it a try. I'll leave you alone. You leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it, it drives me crazy to the point that I had to I had to stay off social media sometimes. I've spent a lot of time, so this whole project has given me a, an outlet. You know, kind of giving me a mm-hmm. a pedestal, if you will, and I can leave my family and friends alone because <laughs> <laughs> I think they get sick of my Facebook posts sometimes. But you know, oh my gosh, I, have, I know. Because, yeah, people don't even think about <laughs> or I annoy my family because, you, you know, in any random movie, something will happen and you'll be like, well, the state shouldn't be involved in that. And my husband's rolling his eyes like, Abby, oh, my gosh, it's a movie. Can, you, <laughs> can we just watch it and enjoy it without getting lectures on anarchy and economics? <laughs> I think you I think you posted something that anarcho Christian group one time about. uh your husband seeing something on TV or something, and it, it, he, he related it to you saying, this is how she wakes up every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, Twilight Zone. There, There's the episode of the Twilight Zone uh, where it's like doctors working on this lady, and she looks totally normal, but they keep telling her that she's like so hideous and uh, the government's requiring her to keep undergoing plastic surgery so that she'll look <laughs> normal and... Um, yeah, at one point she sits up in bed and screams, the state is not God. And my husband looks at the kids and he's like, that's how your mom wakes up every morning. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I like, remember seeing that. I, I laughed out loud when I <laughs> literally laughed out loud when I read that because that's, I th- you know, your husband hears that. My cats hear it every day. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, in the trailer cubby likes to chime in from time to time, but she's heard all this in the past yeah hey folks craig here and i'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog i don't care if you have any experience or not two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing and it turns out they have a real knack for it our project coordinator helps them put the articles together and she publishes them on our website and facebook page and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. The uh, parable that you shared with Matthew 13 in your article, you know, the whole idea behind the gospel is to show the love of Christ without force i never i had never read you know read it the way you did and after reading your article and then reading the parable again that was pretty cool i i think even status could could look at government and be like you know government is force but do they see it but they don't see it that way it's like it's only force if it's against them or their their team yeah not when they're forcing on somebody else right or yeah, it doesn't count like if it's worth it. <laughs> like Right. Yeah, and just yeah, just the idea of that that we're here to to focus on growing the good and not tearing out the evil. Like God'll take care of evil 
and we just have to grow the good. And the idea of doing it on an individual basis, like interacting with real humans, I think that's the other side of it is we want to like outsource building the kingdom to a government who's like, has no interest in the (laughs) kingdom but we're like well they have all the political power they have the police and the army and they can write laws and they can make everything a certain way but um when you really look into it that it it doesn't work out just like with the fda like yeah we all think oh yeah we should have good safe food and good medicines that we can trust and that's a good thing for the government to regulate and make sure nothing bad gets into our food or whatever. But then when you see how it actually works out in reality um, and how it's used to really t- take advantage of us and and stop, stop good things from happening and allow evil things from happening and it just becomes this money-making process based on fear like we talked about before. Um, it's like, yeah, it, if you're trying to use the government to accomplish good things, it's just, it's not possible. Well, I mean, you're asking a human being, flawed human beings who have no interest. It's all self-interest. And I, I've, I've learned that, uh, you know, by watching this, you know, I didn't used to see it that way. I mean, I seriously thought that, you know, if we get the right guy in there, it's just going to get better. Right. We have mounting debt. We are killing people that we'll never meet. Right. You know, and they're using when like, and I hate the term taxpayer. There's no such thing as a taxpayer, but they're using these stolen funds to go kill people. Right. How in the world can a Christian get behind that? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I, I, I used to think that, you know, I mean, I've got family that, you know, that talk about Muslims, you know, that in a bad way. I've met some, I work with a guy who is from Syria. Mm-hmm. This dude is the salt of the earth, man. I mean, he is one of the nicest people I've met. He's funny. We have great conversations. You know, and he was telling me, he was telling me one day we were on break and he said he was on the phone with his mother and they were sitting on the porch watching planes fly by dropping ba- dropping bombs. Oh my gosh. Imagine, imagine this. I mean, it's like it's a, uh, it's normal to them. Yeah. But these are these are these. Uh, this is our government doing this in other countries. Yeah, and I think it's something we totally can't relate to living in that fear, and because it's so far away, I guess people can think of them or those are the bad guys. We're the good guys we're justified in doing this because we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. But it's like, no, they're just dropping bombs on everybody. And they, you know, go to work and go to school and have families just like we do. But our government has the money to bomb them and they don't have the money to bomb us. So that's just the situation that we're in. Well, you know, like it was like Ron Paul said, and I never, I remember whenever he was on the debate stage in the Republican uh when he was running for the presidency mm-hmm. and he was on, on the, on the stage talking about, do you know why they are mad at us? Yeah. I, w- I was one of the guys booing him off the stage. I mean, I was yelling at my TV, like this guy is unpatriotic. Wow. And looking back, that dude is right. Yeah. You Isn't know? it crazy how, how we can kind of wake up to that over time? Cause like well, I, I was, I was never really, I wouldn't say I was a neocon. I was always registered as independent, but I was definitely most of the time a Republican voter. Um, I didn't, I would say I started leaning more libertarian, like really slowly over time. Um, But, and the thing was going back to economics, um, that's what led me more to, to, the Republicans, because you hear like, oh, yeah, they're really good, on, or that's how they portray themselves as being for the free market. Um, like, yeah, they're fiscally responsible. They understand economics. And um, so that's that's what kind of drew me more to being a Republican uh, or voting Republican most of the time. And But then, yeah, seeing what they actually do in practice, it's like, well, no, they... <laughs> They don't believe in free market economics. Like they talk a good game, but 
They oh, it's all lip pass, service. Yeah, they pass regulations left and right just like anybody else does. And um, like especially with the drug war and like Trump's tariffs that everybody's thinks is a great idea. It's like, well, that's a tax <laughs> making you poorer. You can understand that when it's called a tax, but not when it's called a tariff. It's just crazy. Well, it's man, I, I hope I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but it's idiocy. I mean, I, yeah. and, and looking at it, we now, can say that because we used to be idiots, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel like I have a right to say this now, you know. And that's yeah. Well, when you when you really understand it, because that's where you came from, you can be like, yeah, I mean, I was being an idiot. I was ignoring common sense because I wanted to be part of this team that was going to win. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because and I, I, I don't know exactly when I became an anarchist. I felt like I just woke up one day and he's like, you know what? I'm done with all this garbage because. Yeah. Uh, Next month will be two years that I've been living in Memphis. And when I, the, one of the first things I did when I first moved here is I registered to vote. So I know I was still a <laughs> statist when I moved here. Wow. But over time, you know, so it, it, mine was actually a slow progression. If I have anything to be thankful for about Donald Trump is that he led me in this direction. Yeah. Because when he, when he was nominated, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was a, it was a, circus absolutely and i was like there's no way there's no way i can get on board with this guy you know and i looked into libertarianism i was like you know what if i'm going to vote i'm just going to find somebody that is not one of these two yeah you know and i was i don't know if you were uh what's his name the, the guy that was running for libertarian nomination oh what's his last name you know what i'm talking about austin no, I was like way beyond paying any kind of attention to politics at that point. <laughs> oh, so you were you 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 you've been there a lot longer than I have. Then yeah, that's it. Anyway, I, I, I somebody sent me a video of him, and I was like, you know what, this guy kind of sounds like a Republican, but he's actually talking about liberty. Yeah. So I'm gonna look into him. That's how I got involved in with some libertarian groups on Facebook, and I. I I love the, the the ideas behind libertarians, but man, if you watch libertarians on social media, they fight with each other constantly, yeah. <laughs> and it drives me crazy. I was like, y'all are well, we're supposed to be on the same team, and y'all are acting like they're a Republican or a Democrat, yeah, you know. And then you show up at Libertarian National Convention or something, and they got some dude on stage getting naked. Oh my god! Come on, man. And then anyway, in these in these. In these groups, there were anarchists. I don't know how anarchists got tied in with libertarianism, to be honest with you. That's all still kind of confusing to me. But for some, that's that's how I was first introduced to anarchism, was seeing these people. And I thought they were nuts. <laughs> Are you kidding me? There's no way. We have to have a government. Otherwise, it'll be total chaos. Well, guess what? It is total chaos now. Right, exactly. And we keep putting these people in office. Yep. It is beyond me. And, you know, to get back to our point, we are supposed as Christians, Christian anarchists, our king is Christ. Mm -hmm. This is who we follow. This is who's supposed to guide us. And if you look at the teachings of Jesus Christ and compare it to how our government acts, it's vastly different. I mean... I mean, you can look no further than the uh, temptation of Jesus in the Bible and see who's behind government. Right, exactly. But you can't, even when you point that out to people, they think you're nuts. <laughs> but God puts these people in office. Oh, he put God. Hitler in office then, too. <laughs> you know, then he also put uh, Obama in office, the guy you hated. Right. You know what I'm saying? You can't have it both ways. You right. can't. Yeah. The, the, I don't even think it's mental gymnastics at this point. I think it's a status hamster wheel. And he, have you ever seen the video of the hamster in the wheel where he's just going in circles? He's not even running anymore, but the wheel's got suspended so fast. He's just doing circles. It's hilarious. And that's what a status looks like to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, just stuck in the wheel. But we have to we have to get away from that. I don't I, I'm not under no illusion that I will ever see this in my lifetime. Right. You know, I. I don't. I don't know if you ever did any study on uh, 
the founding. I'm fascinated with, with history, the older I've gotten, you know, so I did a lot of study on, you know, like the founding documents and you, the letters that they were writing to each other. Mm-hmm. I don't know what Samuel Adams said, you know, the, he kept talking about posterity. So to me, what we're doing is not for us. It's for the, you know, posterity. People in the future are going to see this or they're going to come across yeah. Abby's article on online and be like, hey, that's that makes sense. Let's try that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I think every little bit that we can affect, like, you know, it happened with you and me that we used to be statists. And then just over time, hearing the ideas that made sense, it changed us. So I feel like, yeah, it can change other people, too. And it might happen slowly, but I want to be part of that change. And especially like for my kids, teaching them a different way um, and for their generation will hopefully be a little less status than our generation, you know? Yeah. I don't have to, I don't have any children. So as long as I keep my cats from voting, I think I'm going to be doing good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I think we probably ought to end it here. All right. Do you have anything you want to uh, plug before we end? No, (laughs) this is the only thing I'm doing. (laughs) Okay, perfect. Well, y'all can go read Abby's, article at thebadroman.com it's pretty amazing and I'm really looking forward to her future articles as well she's uh, a lot more talented than she gives herself credit for (laughs) well thank you thanks for joining us this week on the bad roman podcast Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.